last Sunday night at our children's Christmas program, which was wonderful, uh, those of you who were able to be there and see that. As a part of that service, though, I gave a short message about Christmas gifts, and at one point I said that pretty much every toy that I ever got as a kid is now somewhere in a landfill. And, uh, and of course, the reason for that is because of what happens to stuff, all stuff. It breaks or it wears out or we get tired of it. And while I was saying that, there was a, a, a little boy sitting in, I think, the second pew, and, uh, and he was looking at me and, and shaking his head like, no, that's not going to happen to my toys. They're not going to the dump. Now, I love that he was actually listening to me. That, that part of it just tickled me. I'm not sure he fully grasped what I was, the point I was trying to make, but I assured him right then that someday he would understand that the things that last, that really last, aren't things at all. The love that we have for each other, the joy we experience in worship, that we experience in fellowship, the story, this Christmas story that we get to tell and retell. That's the stuff that matters. That's the stuff that lasts. I have three grown children now. My Christmas gifts to them are way easier than they used to be. Once they got into their 20s, we just would get out the checkbook. And uh, they're perfectly fine with that. And now it's actually even easier than that. Day or so before Christmas, sometimes I wait to Christmas Day. I get out my phone, I open up my Venmo app, and I just drop it right into their checking account. I'll even add a little Christmas present icon sometimes when I do that. But I still remember, and some of you, I'm sure some of you older parents remember the day, those days when you stayed up half the night before Christmas, putting together bikes and trikes and Barbie dollhouses and game systems and computers, all of that stuff. I also remember the tears when some of those same toys didn't even make it all the way through Christmas Day. That's one of the hard lessons, I think, that, that kids learn at Christmas time, that we live in a world where things break and things don't always go the way we want them to. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a Hallmark Christmas. There's just not. Parents and grandparents might do their best to make special, you know, Christmas special, but even in the most protected Christmas bubble, the world still finds a way in, right? There's always going to be disappointments. There will always be broken toys and spilled eggnogs and hurt feelings and and a whole lot worse than that because we live in a fallen world. In March of 2000, I I visited the Holy Lands uh, with about 50 other pastors And uh, the time we were there had been, it was a time of relative peace. And so we were able to move freely around the countryside, even between Jewish and Palestinian areas. And at one part of that trip, we went to Bethlehem and to the, which is really just a short distance from Jerusalem, and to the Church of the Nativity. Now, if you're at all familiar with, with that area or that particular church, you may know that it was built on top of a cave that was identified in the earliest days of the church as the place where Jesus was born and laid in a manger. And you can still go right down into it, and there it is, right under the church. Now, unfortunately, by the fall of that same year, so about eight months after my visit, renewed conflict had broken out in Israel. And that Christmas Eve, the church of the Nativity was actually occupied by armed militants. And the traditional Christmas Eve service that's held there every year had to be canceled. So instead of candles and carols, there were bombs and bullets in Bethlehem. It was one more reminder of the darkness of this world. And that was on the 2,000 year anniversary of Jesus' birth. That was supposed to be a really big year, 2000, year 2000. It's moments like that when the beauty and and peace of a sacred place is shattered by violence, that I wonder how God puts up with it. 
how God can have any patience with us at all because we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. We make it hard for God. But as Jesus explained to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. For so, God so loved this world. Jesus didn't say God loves the world as it should be, the kind of like the ideal world, or even as it someday will be. No, he said that God loves this messed up, crazy world just as it is. And God loves us too, even when we don't deserve it. Christmas is actually a perfect time to talk about God's love for our fallen world because the Christmas story itself is no Hallmark movie. It really isn't. It's familiar, and so it's comforting to us because we've, we've all grown up with it, we've known it, we've heard it, we've seen it acted out hundred, hundreds and hundreds of times probably, but that doesn't make it any less weird. And it is, if you really stop and think about it. The fact is, God chose to enter this world in a really unexpected way. And if you think about it, nearly every part of the story is surprising in some way. From Mary, who was an unwed mother, right? She and Joseph were engaged to be married, but they weren't married yet. This was a scandal. And, uh, and then, of course, you've got, you've got Jesus being born in whether it was a cave or a barn, whatever, it was meant for animals, not for people, and laid in a feeding trough. And then you've got this murderous king, Herod, who was willing, right there in the story, to kill a whole bunch of toddlers on the off chance that he might kill the one baby boy that the wise men said was the king of the Jews. It's a pretty weird story. Luke begins this strange story like this in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This week at, at Dudes in a Diner, we read the same story uh, around the table. And afterwards, I asked the question, what difference does it make that God chose Mary, an unmarried teenage girl, who was living in this little backwater town in Galilee, 90 miles away from the temple and, and the capital city of Jerusalem, to be his vessel of love for the whole world. And the best answer that we could come up with in our discussion was that if, if God could use Mary, then that means that God could use any one of us as well. Like Mary, we are unlikely choices. And like Mary and Joseph and everything else in the Christmas story, we're imperfect as well. That's the whole, that's the whole point. It's not about perfection. It's not about being perfect. It's about our willingness to serve. It's also not about our power or our strength, our ability to make things happen. Because as the angel Gabriel said to Mary, with God, all things are possible. It's not about us. It's about what God can do. 
in the story of Jesus' birth, we see God working in the world as it really is. And I guarantee the first Christmas didn't look anything like what we typically see pictured on Christmas cards or in manger scenes or reenacted in Christmas pageants with fluffy blankets and fresh straw and, you know, everybody looks all clean and neat. I've seen a baby born in real life and it doesn't look anything like that. It doesn't. Now, I'll try not to be too graphic in how I describe it, but, uh, but I can tell you, it just doesn't look anything like that. With my oldest, for instance, uh, he, uh, when he was born, he was uh, actually under stress, which is that's a medical term that means he was in trouble. And, uh, and actually, bef- during a contraction, apparently he had a bowel movement in the womb, and then there was the fear he might breathe that into his lungs. That's called meconium. And so, there was, so all that happened with the first one. Then the second one, when he was born, he came out and, and the umbilical cord was wrapped around his neck two or three times, which is not good. And so the doctor like stopped everything halfway through, quickly cut the umbilical cord, but didn't get it clamped off properly. And it was like a fire hose in the, in the delivery room. And then with my youngest, my daughter, everything seemed to go pretty well with that one until we found out that her oldest brother who held her when she was just a couple of minutes old, actually had a raging case of scarlet fever that we just didn't spot. Strep strep throat becomes scarlet fever. Well, anyway, that that happened with her. So life is messy. It starts off messy. And it never really gets much better. Sometimes the mess just happens to us. Other times, we make messes that we have to live with. We do that too. Either way, the message of the gospel is that God loves us, even in our messiness, and He came to live among us anyway. God came into the world of unwed mothers and homeless families and murderous tyrants and said, this is where I choose to do my work. For God so loved this world, this messy world. What we learn from the story of Jesus' birth is that God didn't need a royal palace, didn't need a king and a queen. All God needed was one faithful teenage girl and a husband that was willing to go along for the ride. In that moment, 2,000 years ago, history rested in Mary's hands. I'm not sure I would have trusted my teenage daughter to finish her homework, let alone, right, save the world. But again, with God, all things are possible. All because a teenage girl said, let it be with me, according to your word. I had an interesting conversation just recently about Mary. It was pointed out how in some churches, Mary is almost treated like a goddess, right? People pray to her. They name churches after her. But at the same time, other churches rarely even talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I don't think that's right either, because the way I see it, the Gospels don't exalt Mary, and they don't even picture her as the perfect mother. I mean, we see places there in the Gospels where she's not. What she is, however, is a really good example of faith and discipleship. When presented with an impossible task, one that would eventually break her heart, she said, here am I. Use me. God so loved the world, this world, that he trusted a teenage girl and her fiancé with the most important assignment ever given. God so loved this world that he gave us his only son. And like Mary, when you realize that God loves you enough to come into the messiness of your life, the best possible response is just like Mary's. It's one of humble obedience. Okay, here I am. 33 years after Mary said to the angel Gabriel, let it be with me according to your word, Jesus said something really similar in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but thine be done. It's the same prayer. It's the same faithful obedience. It's the same willingness to be a channel of God's love for an imperfect world 
even when it might mean sacrifice. I can remember getting a gift once that was so motivated by love that I would have done anything and sacrificed anything to respond in kind. And it wasn't because of the gift itself, but because of the love that motivated it. And some of you, I've told this story before, it's been a few years, but it happened one Christmas when my sons, my daughter wasn't born yet, uh, my sons were like six and three, and that year my younger son, Joel, was basically let loose in Walmart and, uh, and said, you can pick anything you want, we're gonna, mommy's going to buy you whatever you want, you pick something out for dad. And, uh, and so she let him loose and he did, and I didn't know what it was. Uh, but it was something he picked out himself. And so on Christmas morning, we had barely begun opening up our presents when Joel brought his present for me, over for me to open, and he was so excited. He was literally jumping up and down in anticipation of me opening his present. And uh, when I finally saw what it was, I proclaimed triumphantly, a bottle of Elmer's glue! When he saw how happy I was with his gift, he literally squealed with joy. That was a gift given in love. It was given to a father who wasn't perfect, who could sometimes be grumpy or too busy to play, but that's how love works, and that's how God loves us. Sometimes the darkness of this world seems overwhelming. Sometimes it seems like our weaknesses and our failures are too much even for God to overcome. But when you start to feel like that, remember Gabriel's words to Mary with God. All things are possible. What God needs and wants from us is not perfection. So we're not going to get there in this life. But a willingness to respond to His gift of love with love of our own. What better way to celebrate Christmas than to say to God, let it be with me according to your word? What better way to respond to God's gift of love than by, by becoming a channel of God's love in everything we do? Amen.